welcome on behalf of the UK LFI Charitable Trust to this event on Zionism, Palestinian nationalism and the law. I'm delighted to welcome for the second time as speaker at a UK LFI event, Professor Steve Zipperstein, who will be speaking about his new book. Professor Zipperstein has the remarkable accolade of having reached the pinnacle of numerous different professions. He previously served with distinction in the public sector as a former US federal prosecutor and also a Justice Department official, including as special counsel to former criminal division chief and later FBI director and Russia special counsel, Robert Mueller. Later in the private sector as a corporate lawyer, he went on to become the chief legal officer of major global technology companies, Verizon Wireless and BlackBerry Limited. Professor Zipperstein is now a lecturer at the UK, at UCLA with positions in the School of Public Affairs, the Global Studies Program, the School of Engineering, and the Center for Middle East Development, which I, I think speaks to the breadth of his scholarship. He also lectures at UC Santa Barbara's Department for History and is a visiting professor at Tel Aviv University Law School. Professor Zipperstein is the author of Law and the Arab-Israeli Conflict, The Trials of Palestine, published in 2020, and for those of you who haven't read it, it, it's an excellent book and one which serves in many ways as a prequel to Professor Zipperstein's latest book, Zionism, Palestinian Nationalism and the Law, which is the subject of today's event. Before I turn over to Professor Zipperstein, I'll say a few words about the book, which rather like Steve's career manages to span three areas at least, and does so extremely impressively. The book covers history, international relations, as well as the law with respect to four major trials or inquiries that preceded Israel's birth. One of the things that, that the general description of the book and its contents perhaps doesn't ca capture is the way in which Steve is able to discuss these complex events whilst at the same time including astute observations about the individual characters and personalities of those involved, whether it's through private letters to their wives saying what they really felt about the ongoing events or through little details like the dinner menu served to dignitaries when they were considering these weighty events. And if that wasn't enough, Professor Zipperstein concludes by offering some novel legal observations on the effect of the Palestinian rejection of statehood on the legality of their present legal claims, which I'm sure we will hear more about. A few housekeeping points. Firstly, if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We have already received some questions by email and I will put questions asked to Steve at the end of the presentation. Apologies in advance if we don't have time to ask all of them. If you would like me to mention your name and affiliation along with the question, please type that at the end of the question. Otherwise, I will treat questions as anonymous. Finally, UK LFI Charitable Trust is of course a charity and donations can be made by clicking on the donate button on the website of UK LFI Charitable Trust at uklficharity.com or by writing to UK LFI for details of its bank account to make a bank transfer. And I'm pleased to say that donations from new donors and increases in donations from existing donors will be matched by a generous supporter. That's everything from me, and I'm now very pleased to invite Professor Zipperstein to begin his presentation. Thank you so much, Jacob. Thank you to the UKLFI Charitable Trust for inviting me again to speak to you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Let me put my slides up and we will get underway. Here's the title of my book, Zionism, Palestinian Nationalism and the Law, 1939 to 1948. You know, when we think about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the law is usually not the first thing that comes to mind, although we've seen the Palestinians, especially in the last uh, 20, 25 years, uh, make a very, very extensive use of the law to put pressure 
on Israel to try to delegitimize Israel. We've seen it at the International Court of Justice, the International Criminal Court. Uh, we've seen it through the BDS movement. But in fact, uh, the use of the law dates back over a century, no more so than during the British mandate years between 1922 and 1948. And I wrote about three trials in my first book uh, with extensive uh, 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 operation of lawyers and judges, witnesses testifying and being cross-examined under oath, documents being introduced into evidence, those trials occurring in 1929, 1930, and uh, 1936 stroke 37. And in my new book, I write about uh, the four key trials that occurred in the last decade of the mandate years from 1939 to late 1947. Uh, these trials essentially ended up with three different solutions. The London conferences in 1939, the one state solution in favor of the Palestinian Arabs. The Anglo-American Committee of Inquiry convened right after World War II, 1946, the no state solution, uh, recommending that trusteeship or mandate continue. And then of course, the UN Special Committee on Palestine and then the separate UN Ad Hoc Committee, both convened in the summer and fall of 1947, both on a majority basis, came up with a verdict in favor of the two state solution. So we'll talk about these final four trials during the British mandate years. Very interesting to note that the way that the law was used throughout the British mandate involved something that I call transformational legal framing, meaning the parties tried to recast the essentially political religious dispute between them into a legal dispute, a legal dispute involving claims of justice and injustice, involving the presence of victims who had been wronged, legally wronged, and who were therefore entitled to legal rights and legal remedies, such as damages, restitution, rescission, uh, and restoration. The very brilliant lawyer based in Jerusalem, Ann Hertzberg, who I believe is with us this evening, coined the term lawfare several years ago to describe this phenomenon. And building on her work, I've come up with this concept of transformational legal framing. And so let's begin uh, in 1939, uh, early 1939, with the famous London conferences at St. James's Palace. But before I get there, let me just briefly go back to the third trial, the last of the three trials I covered in my first book, the so-called Peel Commission, the Palestine Royal Commission. You see the commissioners here, Lord, Lord Peel there, uh, all in Jerusalem. Uh, they went and conducted a two month long trial in Jerusalem with follow on testimony in London in 1937. And in July, 1937, issued a very extensive 400 plus page report that was the first time in the history of the conflict that the two state solution was proposed. The orange area for the Jews, the purple for the Palestinian Arabs, and the green area between Jaffa and Jerusalem to be retained by Britain on a go forward basis. Uh, the Jews accepted very reluctantly the two state solution offered by the Peel Commission. The Palestinian Arabs led by the, the Grand Mufti Hajamin al Husseini rejected the offer. Britain appointed a follow on commission, the Woodhead Commission, to investigate the complexities of implementing the two state solution, the partition solution. And while the Woodhead Commission was engaged in its work, Prime Minister Chamberlain made his famous visit to see Hitler in Munich, September 30, 1938, returning to the UK, uh, waving the signed document, proclaiming there would be peace in our time, which of course uh, did not happen. Uh, and only a few weeks later, 9-10 November 1938, of course, we had Kristallnacht happen in Germany. Some say this is uh, the beginning of the Holocaust uh, by just a cruel uh, fate of uh, coincidence or irony. The Woodhead Commission, just a mere hours before Kristallnacht began on 9 November 1938, the Woodhead Commission issued a report essentially killing the Peel Commission partition proposal, proclaiming partition unworkable. And so the colonial secretary in the British government, you see him here, Malcolm MacDonald, son of the former prime minister, 
Ramsey MacDonald uh, met with the cabinet in late 1938 in December and decided to invite delegations of Palestinian Arabs, Arabs from surrounding states, as well as uh, delegations from the various Jewish organizations to come to London uh, for discussions with the British government, discussions that turned out to be a trial of Zionism. Zionism was on trial uh, in early 1939 in London. The Arabs refused when they arrived at St. James's Palace to sit in the same room with the Jews. And so Prime Minister Chamberlain, you see him here at the top in the center, flanked by his Foreign Secretary, Lord Halifax, on his right, our left, and the Colonial Secretary MacDonald uh, on the other side. Here is Jamal Husseini, the cousin of the Mufti, Auni Bey Abdul Hadi, the famous Palestinian lawyer. They refused to sit together with the Jews. And so the Prime Minister had to conduct the opening ceremony twice, once here with the Arab delegation, and then separately here with the Jewish delegation. You see Ben-Gurion in the middle, Chaim Weizmann to his left, future Prime Minister Moshe Charette over there to the right. The discussions in London began, the opening ceremonies here, February 7, 1939, and very quickly, uh, the discussions were dominated by a debate, a legal debate, over whether or not Britain in World War I, specifically in a letter dated 24 October 1915 from the High Commissioner, British High Commissioner uh, in Cairo, uh, Sir Henry McMahon, to the leader of the Hejazi or Saudi Arabs, Hejazi at that time, uh, the Sharif Hussein of Mecca, whether or not Britain had promised Palestine to the Arabs. And that alleged promise, the McMahon pledge or McMahon promise, was published uh, as an appendix to this very famous book by George Antonius, which came out in late 1938. And so when the conferences convened at St. James's Palace, the Palestinian Arabs demanded a full-blown legal hearing with the British government over whether or not Britain had made a binding legal pledge of Palestine to the Arabs in 1915. The Palestinians hired the former British Chief Justice of Palestine. You see him here, Sir Michael McDonald, uh, who presented the Arab case to the St. James's Conference in 1939. Well, the meetings in London collapsed without agreement uh, on March 15, 1939, that exact same day. German troops marched into Prague and occupied the rest of Czechoslovakia. Um, and two days later, 17th March 1939, and I found this telegram in the files of the Prime Minister's office at the National Archives at Kew Gardens a couple of years ago. I published a long article in the Times of Israel about a year and a half ago. This heartbreaking, heart-rending telegram from the Polish Jewish community to Prime Minister Chamberlain, 17 March 1939, pleading with the Prime Minister in the darkest and most tragic hours of history, three and a half million Jews in Poland, please open Palestine for us. Please do not trap us in Europe. Signed by the United Zionist Organization of Poland and Agudat Israel of Poland. Well, uh, Malcolm McDonald, the colonial secretary, retreated to his country estate, Hyde Hall uh, in Essex, and began to write the first draft of the white paper. You see it here on the left. I also found this uh, in the files of the Colonial Office in the National Archives at Kew Gardens. And on 17 May 1939, exactly two months after that heartbreaking Polish Jewish telegram, the British government issued the infamous white paper, a capping Jewish immigration to Palestine at a grand total of 75,000 for the next five years. That did two things. It trapped six plus million Jews in Europe, leaving them no escape. Hitler murdered all of them. Uh, and it also locked in a two to one Arab majority in Palestine. The white paper said that within 10 years, Palestine would become independent. It would become an independent majority ruled state. This was the one state solution in favor of the Palestinian Arabs. This, ladies and gentlemen, was the deal, the true deal of the century for the Palestinian Arabs. But the Mufti rejected it. He said, no. Why? 
because he didn't want a single additional Jew to be allowed into Palestine. 75,000 was 75,000 too many for him. And he wanted statehood immediately. He did not want to wait for 10 years. Well, the war came, of course, September 1, 1939, Germany invaded Poland. And um, the white paper remained in effect throughout the war. By the time the war ended in 1945, the 75,000 quota had not even been exhausted. And that leads to the second trial that I talk about in my book, the Anglo-American Committee of Inquiry, 1945 and 46. Let me take you to Valentine's Day, 1945, February 14, 1945. President Roosevelt on the right, uh, after he left the Yalta Conference, sailed into the, um, uh, the Gulf of Suez, the Great Bitter Lake, aboard the USS Quincy. You see him here meeting with uh, King Ibn Saud from Saudi Arabia. Uh, the military person on the left is US Colonel William Eddy, E double D Y, spoke fluent Arabic, was the first US ambassador to Saudi Arabia, served as translator for the meeting. In this meeting, Roosevelt pledged to the king that the United States would not make any decisions about Palestine except after full consultation with the Jews and the Arabs. Roosevelt gave the king a DC-3 aircraft with a swiveling throne to enable the king to see Mecca from wherever he might be flying. Roosevelt died exactly two months to the day after that meeting. He died on 14 April 1945. Harry Truman, the vice president, became president. And immediately, Truman began to hear from Zionists desperate pleas to allow, to put pressure on the British government to allow at least 100,000 surviving Jews in Europe to leave Europe, to escape from Europe and seek safe haven in Palestine. President Truman sent this fellow here, uh, Earl Harrison, a lawyer, Dean of the University of Pennsyl Pennsylvania Law School, to investigate the situation of the surviving Jews in the displaced persons camps, the DP camps in Europe. Harrison sent a typewritten, single space, 10 page report to Truman in July of 1945, the most famous uh, sentence in the report I have here on the left for you, where Harrison says to the President of the United States, we appear to be treating the Jews as the Nazis treated them, except that we do not exterminate them. This made a huge impact on Truman, who went public and publicly called on Britain to allow 100,000 European Jews into Palestine. Foreign Secretary Ernest Bevan, who you see here, uh, did not like the idea at all. He was very worried that allowing uh, surviving Jews into Palestine would anger the Mufti, anger the Palestinians, drive them into an alliance with the Soviet Union. And so Bevan proposed to Prime Minister Attlee to the formation of a joint British-American commission to do two things. First, to investigate the short-term issue involving what to do with the surviving European Jews, uh, try to repatriate them to their homes in Europe, find another home for them outside Europe. The British National Archive files are filled with references to finding homes for Jews in far-flung places such as the Dominican Republic or Alaska. Uh, that was the short-term issue. The long-term issue was what to do about Palestine. And Bevan said to the cabinet, look, we cannot abide the United States government criticizing our Palestine policy from across the Atlantic. Let's bring them into the process. Let's hang this around their necks. Let's make them financially and militarily responsible because we are depleted after the war and cannot do this on our own. And so Truman accepted the invitation to form a joint committee co-chaired by two judges a British judge here, Sir John Singleton of the King's Bench Division in London, and an American judge, Joseph C. Hutchison Jr., the chief judge of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit in Houston, Texas, co-chaired the Anglo-American Committee of Inquiry. Uh, they were given 60 days to complete their work and provide a report or a verdict to both governments. Other members of the committee included, you see him here, James McDonald, former head of the U.S. War Refugee Board, very sympathetic to Zionism, eventually became the first ever U.S. ambassador to Israel. Um, uh, here uh, is Richard Crossman, a brilliant young um, 
uh, unabashed socialist member of the uh, of parliament from the British Labour Party, initially anti-Zionist. By the time the committee con uh, completed its work, he was very sympathetic to Zionism, uh, even suggesting behind the scenes the two-state solution. Here's one of the American members, Bartley Crum, a very flamboyant lawyer from San Francisco, uh, represented lots of Hollywood celebrities here with his client, uh, Rita Hayworth. Here is the committee all together gathered in Washington, D.C. Uh, for their initial round of, of uh, hearings. This photograph, I love this from the cover of my book, shows the committee in the second floor conference room at the State Department in Washington. Uh, you see them essentially conducting a legal proceeding, witnesses testifying, the members of the committee cross-examining them, making legal arguments to each other through their questions, and lots of famous people testified in Washington. Here's Albert Einstein who testified. The hearings then reconvened in London after a trip across the Atlantic. Here is Herbert Samuel, Lord Samuel, the first ever British High Commissioner in Palestine, a Jew um, who was viewed by the Jews in Palestine with some suspicion for not being Zionist enough. And of course, viewed by the Arabs with suspicion because he was Jewish. Uh, the committee then toured the uh, DP camps in Europe. Uh, McDonald, James McDonald, actually went to see part of the Nuremberg trials. Then the committee went to Cairo, took testimony there, and by train traveled overnight from Cairo to Jerusalem. Those of you who have been to the old train station in Jerusalem, of course, will recognize this sign. Uh, the committee toured uh, the famous sites in Jerusalem. You see them here at the Kotel. You see them uh, here at the uh, Haram al-Sharif, or the Harabait, as we call it. Um, the committee stayed at the King David Hotel and held their hearings across the street. You see them here crossing King David Road to the YMCA building where they held their hearings. Here is Chaim Weizmann testifying, Ben-Gurion testified. Uh, here is Jamal Husseini. We saw him earlier in London. He's testifying before the committee. The Mufti, of course, did not testify. He was a wanted war criminal at this point. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Uh, here's Aouni Bey Abdul Hadi. He testified. Mordechai Eliash, the most famous uh, Palestinian Jewish lawyer, he testified. He eventually became the first ever Israeli ambassador to the United Kingdom. Very important lawyer. Um, here is uh, Judah Magnus. Uh, Judah Magnus, originally from San Francisco, California, later the uh, first chancellor of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, not a Zionist. He proposed to the uh, Anglo-American Committee a binational state, Jewish Arab state. The committee uh, really liked him, but thought that he was way too idealistic and not practical. Martin Buber, of course, ceded to Magnus's right. He also gave testimony. Golda Meir testified. Uh, this is the famous Palestinian lawyer, Henry Katan. He testified. Albert Horani, a uh, very famous Arab scholar, Oxford Don, testified. Uh, Ahmed Shukeri, the original founder of the PLO in 1964, he also testified. The Mufti, as I mentioned, did not testify. He had spent the war years in Berlin. Uh, he was broadcasting propaganda messages to the Bosnian Muslims, begging them to join the Wehrmacht. Um, and of course, uh, he also, and we have the documents to prove it, uh, was begging the Luftwaffe to bomb Tel Aviv and Jerusalem in 1943 and 1944. 44. Uh, the committee uh, conducted weeks and weeks of hearings um, in uh, Palestine at the time, in Jerusalem, hearing from all those witnesses. They then decamped to the Beau Rivage Hotel, you see it here in Lausanne, Switzerland, to deliberate their verdict. By this time, the two co-chairs, uh, Justice Singleton from the UK, Judge Hutchison from the US, were barely on speaking terms. There was very little hope of achieving a unanimous verdict, uh, much less a majority verdict, given that there were six Americans and six uh, Brits on the committee. But by uh, the by dint of the persuasive powers of Judge Hutchison and with the help behind the scenes from MP Richard Crossman, the committee actually reached a unanimous verdict against all the odds. And to celebrate that verdict, and Jacob mentioned it earlier, uh, Judge Hutchison decided to throw a celebratory dinner for the members of the committee and their top staff. You see the judge's initials, J.C.H. Jr. on this menu, which I found in his papers. 
uh, in the archives at the University of Texas Law School a couple of years ago. A very whimsical menu, note the menu items, potage balfour, tourne de Truman, au champignon bevin, uh, café Hagana, Chateau Neuf du Mufti. Uh, and this was 18th of April, 1946. And the next morning, the committee members signed a unanimous verdict in which they decided that uh, Palestine should not become either one state or two states, but should continue under trusteeship. But the committee also declared the May 1939 white paper unlawful, a violation of the legal requirements of the mandate for Palestine for Britain to facilitate Jewish immigration, for Britain to create um, the conditions to enable uh, a Jewish national home. And the committee unanimously approved a verdict, a recommendation to both governments, Britain and the United States, to immediately allow, at least during 1946, 100,000 Jewish refugees into Palestine. Well, the British government did not take kindly to the verdict at all. Uh, Attlee and uh, Bevan summoned the British members of the committee for a dressing down. Uh, and Bevan proposed, well, why don't we have a follow on discussion like we did with the Woodhead Commission to kill the Peel two state solution? Let's have another follow on discussion to see if we can kill the Anglo American Committee recommendations. And so the United States was invited to send this diplomat, Henry Grady, a nice guy, but kind of a hapless fellow, to London for discussions in June and July of 1946. And Lord Morrison from the British side convinced Grady to agree to a plan for provincial autonomy. You see it on the right, a green autonomous area for the Jews, not a state, but a province. Think of uh, Quebec, for example, um, the yellow area for the Arabs and Britain retaining not just the land corridor from Jaffa to Jerusalem, but most of the Negev as well. Well, neither the Jews nor the Arabs like this plan whatsoever. Britain would continue to have federal authority over the entire country. Provincial autonomy was not satisfactory to either side. You see it compared to the Peel proposal on the left. And so Britain by early 1947, uh, depleted, exhausted, frustrated, turned the entire matter over to the United Nations. And in the early spring of 1947, the UN formed the UN Special Committee on Palestine, otherwise known as UNSCOP, uh, chaired once again by a judge. You see him here on the right, Emil Sandstrom from Sweden, uh, a lawyer from, uh, from Uruguay, Enrique Fabregat was a member, a Canadian judge, Ivan Rand was a member, a Guatemalan uh, lawyer, Jorge Garcia Granados, a very, very supportive um, to the Zionist cause, uh, wrote a wonderful book about the founding of Israel after his experience on the committee. Here is Ralph Bunch, uh, who served as one of the top staffers to the committee and wrote most of the UNSCOP uh, report. Um, a future Nobel Prize winner. Uh, my office at UCLA is in Bunch Hall, named after him. He was a graduate of UCLA. You needed a special admissions ticket to get into the YMCA building, again, where the hearings uh, were held. And again, many famous people testifying. Chaim Weizmann testified. You see the young Aubrey Eben, Abba Eben sitting behind him. Ben Gurion here on the left testifying. This is what it looked like to the witnesses looking up at the members of the committee. Note there was an Iranian delegate uh, on the right, uh, Iran at that time, not as fervidly anti-Zionist as they are today. Uh, on the left from India, uh, Pakistan had not yet split off and the uh, member of the committee from India was a Pakistani judge who was extraordinarily anti-Semitic and anti-Zionist. Uh, Unscott made a side trip to Amman to visit King Abdullah I, the great grandfather of the current King Abdullah II, and the son, uh, one of the sons of the Sharif Hussein of Mecca, uh, eventually assassinated by the Mufti, by one of the Mufti's henchmen in 1951 as he emerged from Friday prayers at the Al Aqsa Mosque. His grandson, the future King Hussein, witnessed the assassination. Abdullah was in secret talks, of course, with Golda Meir at the time about a two state solution, but Abdullah was very coy with UNSCOP about uh, his intentions. 
Uh, after UNSCOP, the UN appointed a separate committee, the ad hoc committee, uh, to continue to look at the various proposals for Palestine. Another judge, this time uh, from Australia, Herbert Evatt, chaired the ad hoc committee. So you can see the very prominent role of lawyers and judges in all four trials and both UN committees, the special committee and the ad hoc committee, on a majority basis, reached a verdict in favor of the two-state solution, kind of coming full circle back to the Peel Commission of 10 years earlier. A Jerusalem would remain uh, under international control as a corpus separatum, a separate body. The Jews accepted partition. Uh, actually, quite gleefully, they fought very hard for the Negev to be included and uh, were not altogether terribly bothered <clears throat> excuse me, about the corpus separatum for Jerusalem. The Arabs, of course, led by the Mufti uh, from his exile in Cairo by this point, rejected, flatly rejected, renounced the two-state solution, immediately started a civil war uh, the day afterwards, and uh, that, of course, led uh, to the invasion of the new state of Israel by all the surrounding Arab countries on uh, 15 May 1948. So let's take a look at the partition plan. You see it on the right. I've compared it to, <clears throat> excuse me, the Morrison-Grady plan in the middle, the, the Peel plan on the left. Of course, this time the Jews in the orange obtaining more land from the United Nations than they had under the prior uh, British proposals uh, and the Arabs, the Palestinian Arabs uh, retaining the yellow areas in the center there. Uh, the vote on the partition plan came to the UN on 29 November 1947, Resolution 181. Uh, two thirds required to approve. It was very, very iffy, extraordinarily dramatic. The United States was really not that um, much involved until the very, very end. Britain, of course, uh, declared neutrality, said that uh, Britain, British forces on the ground would not enforce any solution that was not accepted by both sides. Soviet Union supportive, Latin American states supportive. And at the end, the resolution passed. Uh, by the required margin, um, and that was what led to a joy in the streets of Jerusalem and Tel Aviv and a violent and bloody civil war launched by the Mufti immediately afterward, leading, of course, as I said, to Israel's declaration of independence on 14 May 1948 as Britain uh, uh, terminated the mandate and left. Uh, and of course, the next morning, uh, the Egyptian Air Force bombed Tel Aviv uh, the armies of Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Jordan, uh, Egypt, uh, even Saudi troops, all invading the brand new state of Israel. And when the war ended through armistice agreements in 1949, you see here on the right, the borders uh, of the state of Israel as compared to the UN partition plan, Israel acquiring more territory as a result of the war, as a result of the Palestinian renunciation and rejection of the two-state offer from the entire international community in November 1947. Uh, I'm really at my last slide here and want to spend a minute just talking about what I view as the very, very significant legal consequences of these trials between 1939 and 1947. Uh, as we saw, the Palestinian Arabs rejected and renounced both the one-state solution in the May 1939 white paper, and they rejected and renounced the UN's two-state solution in 1947. Those rejections and renunciations carry very significant legal consequences. And in my opinion, actually under international law, amounted to waivers. When you renounce and reject an offer, a legitimate offer from the mandatory power of Britain in 1939 and from the entire world community represented by the UN General Assembly in 1947. When you renounce and reject those offers, you are actually waiving the offers of sovereignty over the West Bank and Gaza. And then the Palestinian Arabs did something extraordinarily significant when they formed the PLO in May of 1964 and issued their original charter they reaffirmed the waivers. Look at Article 24 of the original PLO Charter, where the PLO states, and I quote, the PLO does not exercise any regional sovereignty 
over the West Bank in the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan or the Gaza Strip. That was 1964. Today, in 2021, the Palestinians have argued to the International Criminal Court and to many other bodies around the world that they have a legal right to sovereignty over the West Bank and Gaza. But that argument ignores their prior waivers, and it ignores the extraordinarily important legal effect of those waivers, which undermine their current legal claim of sovereignty to the West Bank and Gaza. At no point between May of 1964 and today did the Palestinians somehow magically reacquire the right to sovereignty over areas for which they rejected and renounced and waived sovereignty. And therefore, it's my view that this conflict can only be resolved through politics and diplomacy. The Palestinians might very well, as a political matter, be entitled to statehood. But that's a political issue, not a legal right that they have. And therefore, only politics and diplomacy can resolve the conflict, not litigation. Here's the cover of my book that Jacob held up earlier. And with that, I will thank you so very much for your attention. And I would love to take your questions. Thank you very much. Professor Zipperstein, thank you so much for the absolutely outstanding presentation. And I, I hope you would have seen already or will shortly see uh, from the group messages some of the positive feedback from members of the audience received already. Before I turn to questions from the audience, and, and please, by the way, feel free to continue to type questions into the Q&A box. Um, I just like to put one of my own, uh, and that is to pick up on, on the very powerful waiver argument that you've just made. And I was really struck by a passage at the end of your book or towards the end of your book where you say, when the mandate ended on the 14th of May 1948, the post-World War I international control of Palestine through the League of Nations and later the United Nations also ended thereby depriving the United Nations of legal authority thereafter to reallocate or determine sovereignty over any portion of post-mandate Palestine. And therefore, subsequent UN actions and resolutions granting observer station, uh, status to Palestine and according to Palestine, the status of a state for participating in various UN bodies are um, Ill illegitimate uh, and of no legal effects, uh, summarizing the last, the last part. Now that, that's an extremely powerful legal argument, but I, I'd just like to, to put to you a, a point that perhaps those against uh, Israel might, might make, or against, who are against that might make, which is that perhaps a waiver was made then, but is it not possible for a people for a um, body of individuals who are entitled collectively to self-determination to change their mind and to accept an offer. So, so for example, the, the UK decided to join the EU in the 1970s, but then changed its mind and decided to leave in 2016. Um, so, so what opponents of your argument might say is, is yes, they, they waived, but the offer was renewed and it has subsequently been been accepted. What are your views on that? Yeah, I, I, I'm sympathetic to their position um, as a matter of politics, but not as a matter of law. And one of the mistakes I think that uh, those of us in the pro-Israel community have made over the years is to allow the Palestinians to conflate the legal with the political side of the dispute. And I think it's really important that we treat the two sets of issues entirely separately. In the law, when a party waives a claim or waives their right to something, which is what the Palestinians repeatedly did uh, between not just 1939 uh, and 1964, but I would argue, um, for a long time afterward. It wasn't really until Oslo that the Palestinians once and for all 
uh, said at least for a short time, okay, we recognize Israel and we'll accept in return some form of limited, you could even call it provincial autonomy in area A, uh, certainly not statehood. You could argue that that was another reaffirmation of the waiver of sovereignty because Oslo did not involve any kind of, of grant of sovereignty. So in the law, when a party waives, when they waive their right, when they waive something, and the other party relies on that waiver, as Israel has done for decades. Look at Jerusalem. Palestinians rejected um, any uh, Jewish presence in Jerusalem for decades. Even today, uh, the PLO claims all of Jerusalem for its capital. But Israel relied on the waiver uh, to its detriment, you could argue, uh, by making uh, Jerusalem its capital in 1950 and then by passing the Basic Law in 1980. Uh, and when a, one party waves and the other side relies on that waiver to its detriment, um, then the waving party is legally estopped, E-S-T-O-P-P-E-D, estopped from changing their mind as a matter of law. That doesn't mean, I want to be really clear about this, that doesn't mean that the um, that there shouldn't be a political solution, a negotiated solution. But what it does mean is that the Palestinians are not legally entitled to statehood, and the UN has no legal jurisdiction to confer statehood on the Palestinians. And that is a huge difference, an enormously important difference, because if, if the Palestinians don't have those legal rights, that means that they have no legal standing before the International Criminal Court to pursue prosecutions of Israelis. They have no legal standing elsewhere in the international legal system. That's why this is so important today. We have a question, which is taking into account everything you've presented to us today, how can you envision the 2020 Abraham Accords impacting the legalities of creating lasting peace between Israel and its neighbors in the next five years and beyond? So it's a great question. Uh, the Abraham Accords, I think, are crucial, a crucial element of a lasting peace in the region. You know, for a long time, it was the position of the American government, the British government, the UN, that there could never be peace between Israel and the surrounding Arab states until Israel first, first uh, resolved the Palestinian issue through statehood for the Palestinians, right of return for refugees and so forth. But over the years, a different school of thought emerged, especially among uh, some academics and uh, other intellectuals in Israel, especially in Israel, which became known as the sort of outside in approach. Inside out, meaning we have to solve the Palestinian question before we can have peace with our outer Arab neighbors. But the outside in approach took the opposite view. What if we can make peace with the surrounding Arab states first and show the Palestinians that as between peace and perpetual conflict, peace is the better alternative and everyone else is making peace with us and you may as well too. And that's what we see reflected originally, of course, in the Israeli-Egyptian Peace Treaty of 1979, Israeli-Jordanian Peace Treaty of 1994. Neither of those treaties, of course, contain any provisions benefiting the Palestinians other than to say in the Egyptian Peace Treaty and, and the Jordanian Treaty that the Palestinian issue should be resolved down the road. And now with the Abraham Accords, Bahrain, United Arab Emirates, Sudan, Morocco, Morocco with whom Israel just signed a, a military defense pact with those countries deciding that it's okay to make peace with Israel, to normalize with Israel, to have robust political and commercial ties with Israel before the Palestinian issue is addressed is not a way of ignoring the Palestinians, but instead a way of encouraging both parties to come together. And I want to remind everyone that when the United Arab Emirates signed on to the Abraham Accords a couple of years, year and a half ago. One of their conditions was that the Netanyahu government would drop plans to annex the Jordan Valley and certain other areas of the West Bank uh, 
as contemplated in the Trump peace plan. And Netanyahu agreed. And so one could argue that the United Arab Emirates actually extracted a concession from Israel that could lay the groundwork for future Palestinian statehood. And so I think the Abraham Accords are very, very important. And if you look now at what is going on, especially between Israel and the UAE, it is remarkable. It's miraculous. The number of Israelis going there, the number of Emiratis going to Israel, the number of deals that are being signed in, in the commercial sector, it is really, really incredible. We're getting a, a huge number of, of questions from, from the audience. So thank you very much to everyone who, who's sending them in. Uh, another audience member asks, is there any other example of a sovereign nation waiving a right to territory which has been upheld by an international court? Um, I'll have to think about that and I will be happy to get back to you by email. I don't want to just shoot from the hip here. So I'll think about that and get back to you by email. But of course, I would say that Palestine, from the Arab perspective, is not a sovereign state. There is no such place as Arab Palestine. And in fact, in many of the trials that I cover in both my first and second books, Palestinian witnesses, including the Mufti himself, including Abdul Hadi, the lawyer, including Antonius, all testified under oath that there was no such place as Palestine. No such place as Palestine. It was, in fact, part of Syria. Southern Syria is what they called it. Another questioner asks, we have heard previous presentations in which the argument for Palestinian legal entitlement has been more focused on property rights rather than political entitlement. And the person asks, how does one answer, in particular in respect of East Jerusalem, the claims for documentary titular evidence to particular houses or land. Yeah, well, we saw this, of course, in the Sheikh Jarrah, Jarrah controversy that led to the clash um, uh, with Hamas last May. Um, look, land titles go back to Ottoman times. The Ottomans, of course, the Turks uh, were the um, uh, occupying power between 1517 and 1917 until General Allenby dismounted his horse and entered the Jaffa Gate. Uh, and both sides, Jewish and Arab, uh, make arguments about ownership of specific pieces of property. We have, of course, other properties in Jerusalem in particular that are owned uh, by various um, churches and uh, other owners from around the world. Um, and look, just because um, a bunch of uh, Russians own buildings in London does not mean that Russia has sovereignty over London. And that would be my response to that argument, Jacob. Anne Herzberg, who you uh, mentioned and phrased in your presentation, has sent a question. Uh, she asks, uh, or she says this, you wonderfully describe the UNSCOP hearings and uh, UN support for Zionism. And just as an aside, I can absolutely uh, second that uh, that praise, and in particular the um, descriptions and the pictures um, of the YMCA building, which one can visit today, uh, really bring it alive. Uh, Anne asks this, to, to what do you attribute the sharp turnaround only a few years later, where the UN becomes one of the most notorious anti-Zionist institutions today? Yeah, one, wonderful question, Anne. Thank you for that. It really I would take you even back to the League of Nations. Um, the League of Nations was very, very sympathetic to Zionism. The mandate uh, given to Britain in 1922, the preamble to the mandate granted by the League of Nations to Britain, the preamble talks about the right of the Jewish people to reconstitute, not constitute, reconstitute their homeland in Palestine. And so, and the, of course, the Permanent Mandates Commission of the League was very sympathetic to Zionism and the UN, as we saw in 1947, on a majority basis, approved the two-state solution. So what happened? How did all of this change? Um, uh, for me, it was the Six-Day War, um, number one. And number two, I would say a little bit earlier, probably uh, the UN's dissatisfaction with the outcome of the uh, Israel-Jordan Armistice Agreement of 3 April 1949, 
that basically uh, left Jordan uh, as the occupying power of East Jerusalem and the Old City, uh, leaving Israel with the, those expanded borders as compared to one. There are a few UN resolutions, one in particular um, in, um, in uh, 1950 uh, that um, called again Jerusalem internationalized. But you know, between 1949 and 1967, the UN did nothing, zero, to call for Palestinian statehood in the West Bank. Only two countries recognized Jordan's occupation, Pakistan and Britain. But the UN itself did nothing, zero. Never once called for Palestinian statehood in the West Bank and the Palestinians themselves between 1949 and 1967, never, ever, ever pushed for statehood in the West Bank. And as you saw in 1964, expressly waived statehood in the West Bank in favor of Jordanian sovereignty. So I would say it was the Six Day War. The world was stunned by the swiftness and, um, uh, and completeness of the Israeli victory in June 1967. Um, and at that point, the Palestinian narrative, uh, the kind of transformational legal framing really accelerated. Um, the UN, of course, through UNRWA, uh, really uh, ratcheted up the focus on uh, the Palestinian refugee population. Um, and of course, Arafat, who took over the PLO after the Six Day War, very effectively deployed violence and terrorism which is the exact same thing the Mufti had done in the Arab revolt between 1936 and 1939 that played a very large and powerful role in um, um, Prime Minister Chamberlain's government, Malcolm MacDonald, uh, Lord Halifax's decision uh, to really um, move away from any support whatsoever for uh, Jewish homeland and offer the one state solution to the Palestinians in May of 1939. So I think it was the Six Day War. And I also think that the American government, uh, which until the last administration refused to move its embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, despite congressional legislation requiring it to do so, I think the American government was viewed by many countries around the world um, as sort of iffy in terms of its support, at least on the Jerusalem issue. And I think that all of this taken together led to this very dramatic and very unfortunate uh, turn of events and turnaround uh, leading the United Nations to where we see it today, uh, arguably the most hostile entity to Israel anywhere on the planet, the United Nations itself. We have another question from the audience, um, which I, th I think builds on the point that you just made. Um, can we learn anything from the inquiries and commissions that you have studied as to how we should respond to international inquiries today? Uh, in particular, whether we should engage at all when we know uh, that they are looking to find Israel guilty in, in many cases, if not all. Yeah, the deck is stacked against us for sure. Um, when I was researching the London conferences in 1939, I was shocked to find a um, minutes of a cabinet meeting in December of 1938 when M Malcolm McDonald told the cabinet, look, if uh, the Jews don't come to grips with the fact that they've got no leverage, that um, we need, we the British government need to um, move in favor of the Arabs. And if the Jews don't agree at these conferences to what we want, then we will impose a solution unilaterally, which ended up being the white paper. And so the deck was stacked against the Jews in 1939. It's stacked against us again today. Uh, Chaim Weizmann and Ben-Gurion in 1939 pushed back as hard as they could against the British government, knowing they had no leverage. The only piece of leverage that Weizmann could muster was the possibility of American Jewish financial support for the UK in the coming war that by then everyone knew was coming with Germany. Other than that, the Jews had no leverage. We have more leverage today um, through our uh, political 
uh, in financial means, but we're not going to win. We're not going to win by lobbying the UN bodies. We're not going to win by even making great legal arguments, the kind of legal arguments that Professor Kontorovich that makes that that your organization, UKLFI Charitable Trust, makes um, that Ann Hertzberg makes. We're not going to win, even though we have the better arguments. We're not going to win before these tribunals because the tribunals have already made up their mind that they're going to rule against us. So I think that we need to fight back in the political arena. Um, I think that the example of how the uh, Jewish community in the UK uh, were able to fight back against uh, the Corbynization of the Labour Party was one example of what we need to do. Um, we're seeing a little bit of that here in the US, but not even close to what we need to do to fight back against um, certain elements in the Democratic Party uh, who are extremely anti-Israel. We need to do a much better job of fighting back in the political arena. And so my answer is we need to fight as hard as we can. We need to make the legal arguments we're making, but we need to be realistic that we're not going to win them. And so we need to fight back in the political arena. Another question from the audience asks, how Jordan's relinquishing of its sovereignty over the West Bank, which, as you mentioned, was only recognized by, by two countries. How, how does that chime with the PLO Charter of 1964 waiving it, its rights over it? So how do those two historical events interact? So in 1988, King Hussein renounced Jordanian claims um, to the West Bank. Uh, Jordan, of course, still uh, through the Jordanian Waqf administers um, Al-Aqsa and, um, uh, and the uh, Dome of the Rock and other Islamic holy sites in Jerusalem. Um, so Jordan, of course, still has a very important role to play. Uh, and in the peace treaty, as I mentioned, 1994, Jordan again uh, uh, called for a solution for Palestine and reaffirmed its own uh, waiver of sovereignty over the West Bank. My view is that that um, the Jordanian occupation of the West Bank between 1949 and 1967 did not confer sovereignty on Jordan. And so Jordan's renunciation in 1988 didn't change the situation at all. Sovereignty over the West Bank has been unresolved, unresolved uh, ever since uh, the British Army defeated the Ottomans in 1917. Ever since then, sovereignty has been in abeyance in the West Bank and in Gaza um, and remains to be addressed through politics and negotiation and diplomacy, not through litigation in court. I'll close, if I may, with uh, one final question of my own. Uh, which is that as some in the audience have mentioned your presentation of, and book are absolutely full of little known historical details based on your extensive research. What was the most surprising or notable thing for you that you discovered? So in both books, if I can address both books, by far the most surprising thing I discovered was something I wrote about in my first book. Um, in August 1929, we had terrible violence in Jerusalem and the massacre in Hebron. Conflict at the Kotel at the Wailing Wall led to that. And um, five days after the Hebron massacre, the then Prince of Egypt, Muhammad Ali Pasha, the highest ranking Egyptian, one of the highest ranking citizens of any Arab country, he expected to become king. Unfortunately, he didn't. His nephew, Farouk ascended to the throne a few years later. Ali Pasha was on vacation in Istanbul. And five days after the Hebron massacre, Ali Pasha walked into the British embassy in Istanbul and gave a letter to the British ambassador to Turkey, Sir George Clerk. And in the letter, Ali Pasha said, this violence between the Arabs and the Jews in Palestine is terrible. We need to resolve it. The Jews have a lot of money. I propose that we Arabs sell the Wailing Wall to the Jews for 100,000 British pounds.
Now, Jacob, there had been many efforts before uh, from um, the Rothschilds to the Montefiori's and others from the 1870s onward, Jewish efforts to buy the wall, always rejected by the Arabs. This letter that I found in the files of the British archives was the first and to this day only ever Arab offer to sell the wall to the Jews. It was really, I think, a very astonishing thing to see. I wrote a very long article about that letter in the Times of Israel. I'm very proud that I'm the one that discovered it. Um, nobody else knew about it at the, at the time because uh, the prince lived peacefully in exile for another 25 years after he wrote the letter. If the Mufti had found out about it, I guarantee you the prince wouldn't have survived more than a, a couple of weeks. So that was quite astonishing. And then, of course, the telegram from the Polish Jews that I showed you earlier in this presentation was another discovery that was quite um, shocking to me when I read it. I must tell you that I was sitting there in the reading room at the archives in Kew Gardens. And when I saw this telegram buried in a file of correspondence, and again, I've checked and nobody else found this before me. When I read it, you know, three million Jews begging for their lives. And six years later, there were 75,000 left. It just broke my heart, Jacob. It broke my heart. Professor Zipstein, thank you so much for your extraordinary presentation you. uh, and your scholarship on this topic more, more widely. Thank you everyone in the audience for joining and for your excellent questions. I'm so sorry we didn't manage to get to all of them. The next UK LFI Charitable Trust webinar will be with Professor Greg Rose discussing intersections between counterterrorism and international humanitarian law chaired by Natasha Hausdorff. That will be on the 19th of January. Thank you very much, Steve, and thank you again, everyone. Thank you all very much, and please keep safe and healthy. Have a good 2022. Thank you.